more. Go ahead. This is just related to the stuff that you said about advertising and how advertising um, don't essentially use a, an, an ironic distancing approach. In other words, that uh, they make you share in their cynicism to right. their products. Uh, yeah. One of the problems. That, that's what affects the thing. So yeah, I and mean, one of the problems um, which. Um, advertising has had from the beginning and I know this because I've studied the, the rise of the advertising industry historically and if you go and you read the trade journals and the kind of reflections of people in that field, one of the things that they continually talk about is this thing called consumer resistance that is to say while people want things and people want a good life simultaneous to that um, people are resistant to being propagandized. And when ads are, you know, when we live in an environment where we're surrounded by messages which are trying to get us to rethink things or to behave differently, uh, you know, part of the folk culture, the culture of resistance actually, that emerges within such a society um, is in fact um, very rejecting of the official imagery and the official messages of the society. And by the way, I would add increasingly, one of the ways in which people resist is to create counter imageries. Um, you know, to, and more and more the way in which we tend to understand resistance is through images of resistance more than necessarily say traditional like there's a political resistance or struggles over political, social, or economic power. Um, and as a result, part of what advertising is continually doing, I mean, advertising doesn't operate in a vacuum, it operates in a social world where people are quite resistant to. Now, I'm not just talking about sort of cultural radicals, but your average everyday person tends to view advertising as an intrusion upon them. And one of the things that's emerged in recent years uh, is a kind of advertising which I would one variant of which I've called desublimated advertising. Um, I'll explain that in a moment. But uh, advertising, because it continually faces the cynicism of consumers, has increasingly become aware that one of the ways of lowering that resistance is to, in fact, share the cynicism in the advertising itself to kind of express anti-advertising attitudes, to have people selling you cars telling you that they're lying about the product that they're selling you. And therefore, rather than having this kind of irreconcilable difference, these butting of heads between sort of seller and consumer, to create a kind of, at least on the level of the ad, some sort of commonality uh, of perspective between um, the way in which a company articulates itself publicly and the way in which people as consumers often relate to those companies. Um, I use the term desublimated advertising because one of the sort of pieces of the folklore of capitalism, which is particularly strong in the US, is this whole question of subliminal advertising. Um, when I run into students, all of, one of the first things they want to talk about in terms of advertising is subliminal advertising. I know those ad people, and they, the word sex is embedded all through the ads, and images of you know, naked women, and the ice cubes, and the liquor ads, and all kinds of other stuff. And they've read this book of Wilson, Brian, Key, and they're all, there's this, and now, the fact of the matter is that although there were certain experiments in subliminal advertising, embedding messages. And while most advertising is to some extent subliminal in the sense that beyond, that there are always levels of messages, that the folklore of subliminal advertising has always been much richer than the actual use of this technique called subliminal advertising, right? One of the most uh, interesting developments of recent years for me, it's something I actually wrote about in an art forum column, um, is the way in which more and more ads tell you that there are subliminal messages within the ads. The first one I saw was for some shaving cream called Edge, and it was this guy with a face full of lather, and if you look closely, there were all these like sort of nubile women 
sort of swimming around in his lather. You couldn't see it at first. It was a white-on-white -white kind of design, but they were there, and clearly there to be discovered, so that in certain ways, rather than offending the viewer of the ad, it gave the viewer of the ad a sense of achievement. Aha, you know, I figured this out. It made us feel good to be able to see that. Uh, Absolute Vodka had one where in a vodka glass, very faintly in the ice, it said Absolute. You could see it, and underneath it said Absolute Subliminal in bold letters. Um, the most widely spread one in the U.S., which people in Canada probably don't see, has to do with Camel cigarettes. And that is that for years, like when I was a kid, there was this sort of like folk tales running among teenage boys in particular, that if you looked at the camel on the front of the pack of camel cigarettes, right, and you looked really close on the foreleg of the camel, if you looked really close, you could see a man with an erection. Now, another story was that there was a woman there, nude, of course. But again, you know, circulating around the camel mascot was all this incredible sort of subcultural gossip about if you looked really close, you'd see that the reason why people bought camel cigarettes was because there were these sexual images on the camel. Well, two or three years ago, Camel Cigarettes comes out with a new mascot called Joe the Camel, whose head is a cartoon version of a phallus and testicles and if you turn it upside down, of a vagina uh, 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 penetrated by a pe I mean, it's this most incredibly overt example of, you know, sort of a, a walking genital as sort of a company mascot. And I can't help but think, because I've heard, I've read sort of some interview work with the artist who was very conscious that he was creating somebody whose, you know, head looked like this huge dick, right? Um, that, um, you know, here they take this sort of subculture, which is the resist, cultural resistance among everyday people about what the camel people are trying to do, and all of a sudden to create a commonality of knowledge. I mean, after all, finally camels coming out of the closet, they're sharing with us the fact that their mascot is in fact a phallic symbol or is a genital symbol of some kind or another. And it's interesting because the, the old folklore of subliminalism was really about the kind of healthy paranoia that people felt about living in a world where they're being constantly confronted by these instrumental messages. What happens when you take Joe the Camel and you, in certain ways, make desublimate the subliminal message within the ad is now people walk around New York wearing Joe the Camel hats and Joe the Camel sweatshirts. And so, uh, it's been very effective at breaking down the resistance. What was once, in fact, part of what I think, in fact, is a healthy resistance to the culture of advertising has now been, in certain ways, a taking on of the culture of advertising as sort of a personal symbol. It's just an interesting little historical footnote. Yeah.